Welcome to The Million in One, a place where incredible women entrepreneurs share their stories of triumph, making massive impact through their passions, and transforming the lives of clients one at a time. I am your host, Aru Jashrof, and my goal is to help 100 women entrepreneurs scale their businesses beyond seven figures without overwhelming marketing tactics or burnout. Are you a passionate service provider committed to transforming the lives of your clients? If making an impact is your mission and you're ready to take your business to the next level, then join me at the Triumph League, a million in one, where I share proven methods of scaling businesses with ease and grace. Visit me at www.arujashraf.com and download your own personal blueprint for seven-figure business support. Welcome to another episode of Million in One. This is your host, Arun Jeshra, and today I'm joined with the founder of Pure Spark, Nisha Deed. Naisha Deed, I apologize. Um, Naisha, I'm so excited to be talking to you today about mental health, mental health awareness, and self-care. And I really want my audience to understand that trauma doesn't mean that your life ends. It's just the beginning of a new chapter. And I want to talk about a lot of different things because this is something that's very close and dear to my heart. Um, So let's get started with defining what mental health, mental illness is in the first place and how that translates into definition of trauma. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on today. I really appreciate this opportunity to spread the word of um, mental health um, and, and to try to disband some of the stigmas that are currently out there. And I like the way you uh, described what trauma is. Um, so tra- trauma is one way in which someone can kind of develop these unhealthy coping mechanisms. But if, I, if we talk about mental health in general, we all have mental health, right? If you have mental capacity, then you have mental health, right? What happens to some people, however, is that they can become mentally ill for various reasons. Um, one of which is is trauma, like you just mentioned. Um, that can turn into many different things. Um, you know, um, we're we're right around the holiday season. Um, a lot of people are lonely. Um, we have short amount of sunlight that can turn into depression for some people. Um, some people are pre-exposed to mental illness because of their their genealogy. So if a parent has um, a mental illness, there's a higher chance that their child can in turn become mentally ill. Um, so, you know, that's just a high level understanding of both the two components, you know, both mental health and mental illness. I like how you um, say it's, you know, it's about capacity, the mental capacity. If you have mental capacity, you have mental health. And that leads me to believe that it's about the balance of um, not just your hormones, your physical body, but your emotional and psychological well-being coming together. If you are managing life in a balanced way, you have mental health. When there's a disparity or inequality and balance, that's where you have mental illness. And I think that's a very unique way of looking at a spectrum that is so broad and kind of um, allowing people to choose where they stand on that skill. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's very empowering when you look at it that way, because um, in some regard, you do have some control and in the spaces and places where you don't have control you can get help so let's talk about your journey a little bit of how this became an important issue in your life and how you managed to find that balance and equilibrium for yourself yes so i will try to keep it short uh Mm -hmm. um so i am originally from boston born and raised um in a two-family home. Um, Unfortunately, um, however, my father um, fell victim to the crack epidemic that occurred in the 80s. Um, So he was kind of in and out of the home, but my mom kind kind of led the home. And she's from the South, and she always taught us that 
it was very, very important for us to be able to take care of herself. And I think some of that came from the traumas of, um, you know, her having to be the one to be the, the breadwinner in the family. And then also being um, raised in the South where she spent a lot of her life from probably the age of four to the age of like 18 farming um, or aiding her, her parents in farming. So not coming from a background where she had a lot of money and then having to be the breadwinner of the family really made her focus a lot on education, the importance of education, the importance of being financially free and financially stable. So that's kind of what was ingrained in me as a, as a young child. Um, so that was what I was focused on probably from like first grade into, into college. And so what ended up happening was I went in, into a career only purely because of the money component. Mm. I did not like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not even enjoy the classes. They were, they were difficult. It was accounting. Um, and, but I knew I had in the back of my mind, I knew, Hey, at the end of the day, I just need to make money because that's, that's what's important, right? Like you just need to make money. Like who cares about your happiness? Who cares about if it's something you're passionate about? Just money, 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 money. Um, so and that's not a bad perspective because money does influence a lot of decisions that you are able to make and how um, far ahead you get in life sometimes. Absolutely. Um, and I think it is definitely, it could be one of the, the contributing factors to, to mental illness. A lot of times doctors will ask you, hey, uh, and by doctors, I mean therapists or psychiatrists will ask you, hey, you know, are you financially stable? Because if you're not, that can lead you to depression, anxiety, and stuff like that. So it is definitely one of those things to make sure that you have in balance. But I think when it becomes something that you obsess over um, it, without considering all the other components in your life, it could be detrimental, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, Yes. So, so that's, that's kind of where I was. I was, I was working in a job where I was probably spending 60 to 70 hours a week at times, um, not being able to balance and, and spend time with my family, my loved ones, um, and always feeling like I had to put on a mask when I went to work. Like normally I'm a very bubbly person. I'm very social. I love people. I love talking to people. Um, but when you're an accountant, you spend a lot of time kind of alone in, in kind of looking at spreadsheets. And that was totally not, not in what lit you line up. with who I was. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. It didn't light you up. No, it did, did not light me up at all. Um, so I did it for 15 years, 15 years. Wow. <laughs> okay. I was doing this job and what ended up happening now reflective, you know, this is two years ago. I can look back and say, um, I basically killed my inner voice, you know, and that was the depression. I was mm. super duper sad. All like, you know, I was, I was unfulfilled in a lot of ways. Um, but I kept on putting this mask on. I was like, oh, I'm about to put a down payment on my house. And I have all this money in the bank and I'm trying to vacations. Like, why am I not happy? Mm -hmm. um, and then after really sitting down and thinking about it, it was because I was not listening to my inner voice. I was listening to the voice of society, my mom, you know, maybe friends and trying to keep up with friends that were, you know, excelling in their careers and, and kind of going through these different phases of life. But that wasn't for me, you know, right. and I literally, my life came to a halting stop maybe two years ago around this time when I um, tried to overdose on, on medicine to end my life because I was just so in, in depression the feeling is just like you're dead inside that's the only way that I can explain it to people is like you just feel like you're a shell of a person yeah. um, and, and you have the burden of carrying this heavy body around and dragging it yes. to do things that you have so yeah. desire to do <laughs> zero zero but I thought that's what all Americans did. I thought that's what that what life was about like I was like well why 
can't, why, everyone else seems to be doing it okay. Like, why can't I do it? You know, why can't I seem to get my act together? So there comes the guilt and the shame um, and the and frustration. The yeah, and the, just the pressure to perform and keep up this yeah. mess. Yes, absolutely. It was, it was way too much. It was way too much for me. Yeah. And I think especially in the online world uh, with online entrepreneurs, this is more prevalent because it is as to some extent, a lot of it is a performance of, you know, you're, you're selling what you have created versus what you, the transformation that you're getting people. And I think when people get caught up in that performance, that dissatisfaction just grows and grows and grows until people find themselves at the breaking point of just like, I just don't want to do it anymore. It would just be easier to not wake up tomorrow. Yep. And unfortunately, um, suicide is the number one killer for teens, I want to say from 13 to 19. So when I was born, I was born in the 80s. Like, I didn't have, we didn't have social media back then. So it's all kind of very new for me, you know, within the past maybe like 10 or so years, like was my first Facebook post. But if I think about children that were born into this, I feel for them. Like right. it's, it's, it's sad. It's super sad. Um, because not only do you have your parents that are, you know, obviously, um, putting pressure on you, but then you have the internet and you're looking at, you know, pictures that are very like one-sided. You see only the happy side, but you don't see all of the work that was done to get that person there. Like you said, the transformation and the things that the, that person had to go through. You're just seeing the final product and you're thinking, wait, well, I want to be like that person. And, you know, well, that takes work and you don't know what they went through. Right. And then you have people in the name of authenticity sharing things that, you know, are not meant to be shared in public or are sharing issues that they don't have the expertise to talk about and are misleading people into putting extra pressure on themselves to say, if you just behave this way, and if you just change your way of thinking, then all these riches are going to fall into your lap overnight. And oh that just my creates gosh. this pressure when people are trying to replicate that and they're struggling. And when they oh really, God, totally. what they need is someone by their side to say, where you are is exactly where you need to be. Mm-hmm. I agree so much. It, it's very dangerous, I think, um, the influence that the internet has on on people. And in some degree, I don't even think people realize how big of an influence um, the social media um, and the media just in general has on them. But if we look back, obviously, to the election and what happened, <laughs> you already know that it's very powerful, extremely powerful. So Absolutely. we do have to be cognizant. We really do. And, you know, it's just like you never know who's influencing you and what their real story is. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what was your turning point? You were at this brink where you were contemplating suicide. What turned yes. it around for you? So not only contemplating it, but acting on it. I was, I was active, yes. Um, and I have to shout, shout out my family because they are a saving grace. So what ended up happening around that time, two years ago, around this time when I was suicidal, um, I, my, my family, I lived in D.C. I should mention that. I was living in Washington, D.C. for seven years, and my family, all of them, um, most of my close family is either in Connecticut or Boston. Um, so what ended up happening was, I guess they kind of caught on that I wasn't doing well because um, they, they kept calling me like every day. I would have a family member or an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, like, Naisha, hey, what's going on? How are you? How's work going? Da, da, da. And I'll, I'll be like, I'm fine. Yeah, things are good. And they'll talk to me and then I'll hear from another person. Um, but what ended up happening on that day where I became extremely suicidal and acted upon it, um, my family kept calling. Multiple family members kept calling and they couldn't reach me. Um, so I do have family members that are in uh, 
kind of social work and there are therapists, social workers and nurse doctor. And so they knew what to do. They called the police and what happens is the police can do like what they call a safety check. So if you're, if you're having a concern with a family member that you think is suicidal and may have harm themselves you can call the police and what they'll do is they'll come by to their that person's house and they'll do what they call a safety check um so they'll you know go and knock on the door um and kind of say okay is everything okay here you know your family is is a little bit worried um so th- so that's what happened to me i had um the leasing office because i was living in an apartment building um the the manager in the leasing office came um, to one door and knocked on the door and I was like, you know, I, I guess I was wake, waking up out of my sleep or whatever, my unconsciousness. Um, and, you know, I was like, who's at my door? Like, who would be coming to my apartment? Like, I was, I'd been in the apartment for like a week straight and trying not to be, be seen by anybody. And I was like, well, who could that be? Um, and it was the manager, like I said, from the leasing office and she had asked if everything was okay. And I told her, yeah, everything's fine. She's like, oh, well, your cousin had called. You might want to call her back. And I was like, all right, well, thank you. And then I closed the door and then the police were down on the opposite entrance. I had two entrances to my apartment, one from inside and one from outside. So the person from the leasing street entrance, um, and at that point I knew like, I was like, okay, I guess the jig is up. I can't lie to the police because, um, I had a box of pills that were open on the floor and they had asked me all these questions and I told them the truth and they were like, you know, Hey, we got to take you to the hospital. You're not doing well. Um, you're a danger to yourself. You know, we need to get you some help. And, um, at that point I was not interested in going, um, at all um, to the hospital. But when I saw that my sister and my cousin had driven down from both Connecticut and Boston, I was like, all right, I'm not in this alone. I have the support of my family. And from that day on, it was like a probably a year and a half, um, probably a good year of like, I still don't feel good, um, but I have my family and my friends who are telling me, Naisha, don't worry, you will get better. And it was really because of them that like, I knew I had a chance. Because if I was doing this alone, I don't think I would be talking to you right now. Um, But I had the strength of others to be like, hey, if you're weak, we'll be strong for you now. Don't worry, don't feel bad. Take as long as you need, we will help you. Whether it's coming from the world of entertainment, integrative medicine, quantum theory, conspiracy facts, ancient archaeology, sacred geometry, financial trends, or perhaps even from the very world of self-help and motivational speaking, Real Revolution Radio possesses the information you need. Listen today to our daily inspiring lineup of podcast radio talk shows only on realrevolutionradio.com. awareness is anchored in our core knowing, we become limitless. We walk our daily lives anchored in our truth, feeling liberated and boundless. Christina Schwind is the owner of Light Body Therapeutics, as well as a master tracker and multidimensional activator. She is a powerful light body healer with a unique and thorough approach to resolving chronic pain, anxiety, and trauma, as well as opening one's intuitive abilities. Light Body Therapeutics brings forward a highly refined process of accelerated energy medicine to unravel the stuck and old mechanisms at the root level. This effectively and permanently removes the interferences that blind us to our multidimensional awarenesses. We are all hardwired to perceive multidimensionally and all of our incarnational experiences are influenced by the organizing principle of our light body. Sessions with Christina can be done in person or remotely, as well as other services found on her website, www.lightbodyinc.com, or email 
info at lightbodytherapeutics.com. Open your innate abilities and become limitless by contacting Christina Schwinn today. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. to the Marine Show, where we will introduce you to the world of alternative remedies. Join Marine Pisani as she hosts discussions with leading experts in the fields of hypnotherapy, acupuncture, yoga, Ayurveda, EFT, chronic healing, integrative medicine, and so much more. Marine will also brave topics that many consider taboo. Yes, taboo talk. Tune in today to the Marine Show heard on popular social media, and now, on Smart TV. It's a mindfulness radio production only on Real Revolution Radio. Dot com. Five, four, three, two, one. Cleveland, we now have liftoff to a higher level of consciousness. Tune in to realrevolutionradio.com, the number one source for independent music and inspirational podcast radio. Awaken, evolve, inspire, and join the evolution only on realrevolutionradio.com. You're listening to realrevolutionradio.com. There's hope as long as you're alive. I love that so much. I love that they say, hey, if you're not strong, it's okay to be weak, because yeah. recovering, going through depression, going through suicidal thoughts, it's not a linear process. Yeah. Um, when I think back to the people in my life who've committed suicide, mm. it always caught us off guard, because yes. while we were there through the dark times, and people then see you doing well, and they say, okay, this person has finally, like, cross the threshold when they're not contemplating anymore and sometimes Mm. the darkest days are followed immediately after when you feel like everything is good because it can just take this tiny little thing to push you and Mm. I want to talk about like what are some of the signs like you were lucky enough to have family and friends who support you unfortunately that's not the reality for a lot of people who are suffering Especially around the holidays when it is difficult not to be around family, not to be around friends, or just be surrounded by people who don't understand. Yeah. Um, And not everyone can be trained, not everyone can be supported, not everyone has the resources. What are some of the signs um, that people should look out for? Yeah, well, I think that it's so difficult for someone with a mental illness to um, tell and and kind of out themselves because they don't want to be looked at as crazy, a burden, insane, a psycho, all these stigmas that we have. So a lot of times when someone is ill, you're not going to know, unfortunately, because they are going to do whatever they have to do to put on a happy face, even though underneath that happy face, they're crying, they feel lonely, they feel scared, um, and they feel, you know, kind of misunderstood. I I just want to put that out there because um, a lot of times people will say to me, Naisha, well, I had no idea you were sick. I, well, yeah, duh. (laughs) I'm not, like, I was not in a space where I felt safe to 
let anybody else know um, because no one else was talking about whatever struggles that they were going through. So I think that it's super important for people to be vulnerable because in that vulnerability, you never know who you're helping um, by saying, oh my God, like, Last week, I was so depressed, and I had to go to talk to a therapist. And then that other person might say, wow, really? Like, who's your therapist? How was the therapy session? What did you learn? Hmm. Oh, did you have to take meds? Oh, what kind of meds? Oh, da 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 You know, I think once we start doing that, then people will feel safe when they're having an issue or, you know, they're not feeling well, or they think that they might be depressed. I talk about, I talk about mental health so much that, you know, um, mental health and mental illness so much that like people who have never talked to me about any issues that they, that they were having are now coming out the woodworks. And I'm like, wow, you too? Really? Oh my goodness. You too. Uh, Yes. Absolutely. And I, I found the same thing when I started talking about it, like after my divorce, when, you know, things were just going on and on and on and we're just not in yeah. vain. I had those moments of just like, oh my God, it would just be so much easier to swallow all these medications and just not wake up tomorrow instead yep. of having to go through this drama, unnecessary drama every single day for two years. Um, oh. And you know, people are just like, but you're just so strong. Like, why? Why are you feeling so defeated? And mm. it was just like, because there's a lot of pain and trauma. Uh, because and you're human. Because you're <laughs> human. Period. Exactly. <laughs> you're a human being. <laughs> and sometimes when you're going through that pain, you need to talk about it. And it's hard and it's people feel like they don't know what to do and they become awkward. And for anyone who's ever in that situation, my guidance is always like, just listen. The other person just needs to unburden what's on their heart and on their mind. That's all they really need yeah. in that moment. And that Absolutely. could be the difference between them waking up the next day. Totally. Absolutely. And so, I, I think, oh, go ahead, sorry. So let's talk more about your mission now. Um, how are you transforming this into a business, a um resource and you know uh, as a advocate what are you creating for this yeah so um in may of this year 2019 um i went live with my story so what ended up happening was mclean hospital was and still is doing a campaign called disbanding the stigma And what the campaign is all about is bringing a face to mental illness. And I had heard about the campaign um, from my mom. She had sent me an email and she said, you really should get involved with this. And I, and I kind of looked at it and I was like, oh my God, like I have to share my story and, and, and let it all out. And they're going to do a photo shoot and my picture's going to be plastered possibly all on the trains and stuff like that. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is a little, uh, nerve wracking, um, But I decided after giving it some thought for maybe like a couple of days, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to out myself. And, um, this, this probably means that I won't go back into corporate America. Like once I made that decision, I was like, you know, this probably is going to ban me from doing some of the things that I once thought I would do. But you know what? this mission is so important to me and sharing my story is so important to me. I don't care what people might think um, because when I, when I share my story, I take the power, you know, I take the power that it has of me away. So um, when I decided to go viral or go live with that campaign, um, I also kind of before then was looking for for work in mental health and I was looking for work that kind of dealt with communities of color the communities that were at a disadvantage of communities that weren't really getting the help that they needed and I couldn't find I couldn't find any organizations that was doing it I just Mm. I was like I was like they all the organizations were either like in like places that were very diverse like um 
DC, New York, um, Atlanta, and areas of that. But I couldn't find any in Boston, and I wasn't I wasn't leaving my family again. I said, nope, <laughs> I'm here with my family. I'm here with my support. I'm not leaving them. I'm staying in Boston. So I said, you know what? I guess I'm going to have to create my own organization. Like, if you don't see it, you got to create it, right? Amen. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so um, there's two things that I do. Um, I speak. I I talk about my story. Um, I'm very open and honest, and I answer any questions that people might have of me um, as it relates to to mental health and mental illness, and and sharing my story with people. Uh, cause I believe that that's so important. Um, so that's kind of a, a money generator for me. I have three speaking engagements coming up this month, only one of which is paid. The other ones is kind of, you know, um, I'm, I'm volunteering for them. But then on the flip side, I am creating a nonprofit, like you mentioned, called Pure Spark. And what Pure Spark is currently doing is it's it's advocating for mental health. So a lot of the work that we're doing now is this on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram, as well as LinkedIn, just talking about the importance of, of mental health, mindfulness, um, prioritizing self-care, setting up boundaries, um, a lot of like what I call psycho educational type of things. So what is PTSD? What is bipolar? What is borderline personality disorder? All of these things. What is schizophrenia? All of these things that people kind of, you know, don't really know about. Are they, they kind of look at it and be like, Oh my God, what is that? Like, I hope I don't have that. I kind of try to normalize it. Um, and put it in plain English so people can kind of understand it more. And then I also talk about what I, allies can do, what people um, who love someone who has a mental illness, what they can do to kind of help them along. I um, mean, also, more importantly, what they should not be doing <laughs> right. um, as well. Um, and next year, I'm hoping to have a retreat. Um, already have we already have the space kind of figured out. Um, hopefully, it'll be in Vermont. Uh, my family, um, not my family, a friend's family owns property out there. So we're just trying to do something in in the fall to kind of give people who are in the inner city a break from all the stress that they're in and introduce them to different tools like sound healing, yoga, tai chi, um, dancing, drums, anything that people can kind of use to tap into their own pure spark and to kind of get their spark back after a divorce or after a traumatic experience or after a deep depression or um, after feeling so much anxiety for all of their life. I want people to find um, different ways to heal and know that healing is not not only going to therapy and taking meds. Healing can be a lot of different things. I want to I want to touch on something that you said that really resonated with me is when you don't see a resource become one and create something for communities of color. That disparity is really startling. Of a communities of color don't like to talk about mental illness. Two organizations don't reach out to them and say this is a prevalent issue within this community. So there's this like double whammy of, of silencing voices that A, need a platform to be heard, and two, they need that support and acknowledgement and just reassurance that this is normal. They're not, I, I don't want to say they're not unique because they're suffering from these uh, conditions. It's this is a human element and every community is impacted by it. So the access has to be just as greater and equal for everybody. So I really commend you on recognizing the need and taking out on that. Thank you so much. It really is an important, um, it's a very important thing to talk about. And because the more diverse that we become as a country, the disparity is not closing in, it's getting worse. And I feel like that 
there is a sense in communities of color that depression, mental illness is, you know, it's a privileged disease. Yes, yes, it's it's a white person's problem, right? Yeah. Correct. And I think there is some history, especially if I if we look at the African American community, um, and we look at the history of African Americans in the United States. Um, for example, we weren't even considered to be human. And a lot of times um, we weren't considered to even have a mental capacity. So therefore, the belief was that if you don't have a mental capacity, then how can you possibly become mentally ill, right? right. So a lot of the times we weren't even considered um, when, you know, you had all that all the research that was taking place. Um, we weren't considered in that. Um, and we still but are you, not. Yeah, and we still are Fast not. Forward, it's, it's getting years. better, but it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're, we're still not if we look at the numbers in comparison to um, our white counterparts. Um, and that can go for Latinos, that can go from people of Asian descent. It does not matter. Um, for whatever reason, I mean, we can look at a lot of different reasons. Um, minorities and people of color are not being considered. And a lot of the, the research that gets done in psychology, and that is a huge problem. Um, and the whole misnomer that um, we can't get sick is keeping us from getting the help that we so desperately need. And if I look at the African community and Latino community, which I'm, I have such a a more of akin to that I'm a little bit closer to we look towards the church to fix everything <laughs> you know go right. pray go pray oh if you're depressed go pray oh if you're you know stressed out go pray go pray go pray get your bible you know like read the bible but I'm like hold on but wait when somebody has a heart murmur or they broke their arm do you tell them to go pray Right. Or do you tell them to go to the doctor? <laughs> we need to start redirecting people to the right places. Um, and I really think, I mean, I can go on and on about this, but I won't, because I know we're probably running out of time. But um, pastors and, and, and people who are leaders in the church really need to start um, getting educated on if this is like something that's a spiritual thing versus, oh my goodness, this person might be mentally ill and I need to direct them to the proper resources. Absolutely. I, I, this is a community problem. This is not yes. just a one person problem. This is a community problem. And the solution lies in just reconnecting with community and making it okay to discuss issues. I mean, at the end of the day, human beings are social animals. We were never meant to be surviving in isolation. And even with the advent of how connected we are through social media, I find more and more people find them completely isolated from their community. Totally. I, I, I think, unfortunately, it's the mis misconception, and that's not even the right word, but um, you know, you think that, oh, I have all these followers and all these friends on, on Facebook, like, you know, I'm, I'm so popular, but then you're sitting in your home all alone and you're not picking up the phone to talk to anybody. You're not going to people's homes. Like, like I said, I keep going back. I feel like a, a baby boomer because that's what my mom used to do when I was younger. She would always go back to her childhood. But it, it's true. If I go back to my childhood and I think about how we, I used to connect, we were outside connecting with people like our friends and people knew each other's names and neighbors knew each other. And now... We are so disconnected, and I think that is also a large reason as to why people are feeling um, a large sense of loneliness, which does lead to depression. Um, it's all connected. It's and all we're not connected. just and it's disconnected from other people. We're disconnected from our own bodies. Oh, yes. <laughs> Even worse. You're right. Absolutely. Yep. We are totally disconnected. 
totally um, because we're, we're reading and we're seeing all these things um, and we're thinking that, oh, well, that's what brings happiness. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to buy that car and I'm going to buy that house and I'm going to get married to that guy and I'm going to have all these kids and that's what's going to get me happy. That's what's going to make me happy. And then when you do it and you're not happy, you're sitting there like, hold on, wait, I thought that was the formula that exactly. the media is pushing this, society is pushing this on to me. And so why is it not working? Well, maybe it's because you, that's not what you really want. <laughs> And you yeah. need to to sit alone, possibly, meditate, go to therapy, and and kind of figure out, journal, and figure out what it is that you really want. Who are you really? What are your what are your core values? You know, is money important to you, or or is humanity, uh, society issues? What what matters to you? And a lot of people, you ask them, and they're like, I have no idea. <laughs> I, yeah. I have no clue. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, because you said we were working on this auto programming of what society wants from us and what society expects from us. And who created these constructs that we we're living out? We have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> it was just preordained somehow for us to live in a certain way. And so we we're just following the pattern. And I think it's time we start breaking patterns and start creating new ones. I agree. I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, I believe you're going to do incredible things. So thank you so much for your time today. Uh, tell my audience where they can follow you and find you and learn from you. Absolutely. Um, you can follow me on Facebook at your pure spark or sorry, Facebook is just pure spark. So P U R E S P A R K. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram at your pure spark so that's y-o-u-r-s-p-a-r-k p uh, oh my god i'm sorry You're i'm good. like slipping <laughs> <laughs> your pure spark so sorry y-o-u-r-p-u-r-e-s-p-a-r-k um as well as on twitter the same handle um and you know i post i try to post daily um if not multiple times per day just sharing all the information that i just mentioned to you Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being an incredible community resource and keep shining bright because your light is so needed in this world and I'm, I'm grateful you're here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And everybody, absolutely go ahead and follow Naisha and make sure you grab your book uh, from my Amazon link and happy holidays. We'll talk to you soon. Heard instead, dear listeners, through podcast radio on realrevolutionradio.com. Never before has inspirational podcast radio been taken to this next level of wow. Until now, today in the age of information, more and more people are searching for answers and in solutions and how to better approach and perceive every day-to-day -day concerns by tuning in to realrevolutionradio.com. Isn't it about time we take back our lives, back in consciousness? In a higher state of awareness, in the evolution of our own state of higher well-being. Yes, we can do so consciously every day by tuning in to the many groundbreaking and third eye-opening podcasts. Our new Cleveland-based network of over 33 paradigm-shifting internet talk shows. Only on realrevolutionradio.com. Be part of that change. Evolve. Be inspired.